Some say these atolls were hauled out of Pacific's deep by three Tongan fishermen, Maui Mua, Mai Toto, and Maui Muhi. But geographers tell us that these coral atolls are the life's work of millions upon millions of polyps that settled and died, layer on layer, until through countless ages they rose to the ocean surface and beyond, to six feet above the waves. These are the atoll people, the people of the Tokelau Islands, New Zealand's northernmost territory, just eight degrees below the equator. The group is made up of three atolls, Atafu, Nukunono, and Fakaofo, each separated from the others by about 50 miles of ocean. People had little enough when they made these coral outcrops their home. They've little enough now. But like all Polynesians, they've adapted themselves to their environment and get the best they can from it. The islands owe their discovery to Commodore Byron, fruitlessly searching for the mutineers from Captain Bly's bounty. But having been discovered, they were left unwanted until the pleas of the islanders persuaded Britain to annex them in 1916. New Zealand assumed responsibility for them in 1925, placing them within its territorial boundaries and giving the people New Zealand citizenship. Life is centered on the family group. A council of elders represents the families and plans work for the village labor force. In this way, the traditional form of patriarchal authority continues in Tokelauan society. Word of the plan is carried through the voice of the local constable, who also doubles up as the town crier. <laughs> The atolls share a common problem, too many mouths to feed. It's impossible for them to support themselves. On Fakaofo, the position is critical. Over 800 people live on five acres, and the population is increasing. A scarcity of essentials governs every act. For instance, there's so little timber suitable for working that the desperate need for another canoe was weighed against the felling of this, the largest tree in all of Fakaofo. The design and construction of canoes hasn't changed through the ages. Because trees do not grow to a suitable size, each canoe is made in sections, which are easily replaced when necessary. With all the skill of a bespoke tailor, the new is fashioned and sewn to the old. Fish forms a major part of their diet. But since their fishing grounds, out beyond the reef, have been discovered by the Korean and Japanese fleets, bonito and tuna are now more difficult to locate. And time is spent dangling a hook for whatever happens along. Only the lagoon offers any certainty of fish. Using modern nets and old-time methods, fishing the lagoon is becoming more important to the daily routine. The communal effort and love of the sea makes this more of a game to the fun-loving islanders. I'm <laughs> 
Pigs and chickens, which have free range of the home island, are slaughtered only for very special occasions. Then every family shares a momentary change of diet. The hurricane, which swept through the whole group in 1965, severely affected their already precarious living. Waves washed right over the low-lying atolls, the highest points only 10 feet above sea level, taking trees, houses and topsoil with it. The sea governs their lives, supplies them with food, but also keeps them from it. While they live on one islet, they're forced through overcrowding to use small portions of the other motos as gardens. Around the village, soil is scarce. Fertile earth is made by mounding up coconut husks and palm leaves. The delicacies of taro and bananas are carefully nurtured. In the Tokelaus, there is little scope for development. The resources of the whole group's two and a half thousand acres of infertile coral land are limited and cannot support the population's simple pattern of life. <laughs> As the flow of money from relatives in New Zealand increases, so does the reluctance of those at home to work in the tropical heat, gathering and husking nuts for copper. The amount gathered fluctuates from year to year and provides the only source of revenue, apart from what their relatives send them. separating the atolls, each acts independently of the others. There's no need for any sort of formal community plan because it's always been the normal Polynesian way of life for everyone to work for their common good. Because the group lies off the normal sea trading route, the government chartered ship Arnu calls four times a year bringing the luxuries of life. Tobacco, kerosene, powdered milk and flour, sweetmeats for the children and dresses for the girls. The air on ship days has a changed aroma, while families hover round hot coral embers waiting to satisfy temporary cravings. Outside influences are few. There's cricket, Polynesian style, played with a bat that more closely resembles a club, its original purpose being changed by pioneering missionaries. The largest bell ever cast in New Zealand was commissioned by the Whakao for people living in New Zealand for their church at home. The Catholics and London Missionary Society share equally the population of just over 1,800. Church is the strongest influence in these deeply religious island people. Six days thou shalt labour, and the devil take those who work on Sunday. Teachers for these schools receive their training in Western Samoa. To improve the standard even more, husband and wife New Zealand teachers are being seconded to each island for two-year periods to help the children. But for what?
Because there's neither industry nor commerce, only a few of the brightest children receive scholarships for further education abroad, with a possible future in their island's administration. Tradition demands that before visitors may step ashore, they must first be greeted with a whakapuka, feasting and dancing, to show they come in peace. The Tokelau Islands are administered by the New Zealand High Commissioner in Western Samoa, who, to keep abreast of requirements, makes frequent visits to discuss problems with the Fonoa Faipule, the Council of Heads of Family. Medical teams accompany the administrator to assist the local doctor. Each island has its own hospital, which apart from the usual run of births and deaths, deals mainly with eye troubles caused by fishing and skin diseases due to the limited supply of fresh water. Until recently, filariasis was common, but this follow-up survey has shown that it's been completely eliminated after an earlier campaign. Discussions on the future of these atoll people have been in progress for some time. In 1964, the Tokelauans rejected amalgamation with Western Samoa or with the Cook Islands and asked for continuance of their direct association with New Zealand. Because overpopulation is already a problem and with little future here, many favour a progressive shift to New Zealand. In consultation and agreement with this Tokelauan people, New Zealand has evolved a far-seeing plan for their resettlement in which to play. A welfare officer of the Maori Affairs Department is on hand to help answer questions from the families and girls going to New Zealand under this resettlement plan. Have you girls any questions this morning? Yes. yes. How do you get water in New Zealand? If I want to send a letter to my parents or someone, what can I do? What about my holy days? Can I get some coconut there? There's no lack of people wanting to go to New Zealand, but few have any conception of what they're going to, nor realize the great changes and adjustments they'll have to make in their new world. Only the Polynesians know the strength and riches of relatives, the feeling of security and old beliefs, the bonds which tie them island to island. Tofa Nukunono Tofa Atapu Tofa Tokelau From an island home where more than 800 live on five acres, across the sea to a city where within its boundaries are parks larger by far than the reef fringed land of their birth. Initially, the reaction from arriving is not one of wonderment or fear, just tired out bewilderment. The light of industry and commerce catches and engulfs them in a day. For the first two years, until they've accustomed to New Zealand ways, 
the families and girls are directed to employment away from influences which could have a bad effect on their future. In comparative seclusion, the families are given homes in a forest area where new neighbours give guidance and some badly needed love to their fellow New Zealanders. shares with Santa the awe of new things previously only heard of. But since the other, wiser children are excited, it must be all right. Small, everyday things need explaining, the things we take so much for granted. The telephone and grocery, everything. It's easier for the men. They've already had experience of cutting down trees. The only differences are the great number of trees and the host of machines. There are no machines on the Tokolaus. Children adapt so much quicker. It doesn't matter that the climate's not as warm. Horses and cows, houses and cars are strange. But it's not long before all children see things the same. Girls in Auckland and Wellington, or wherever they've been directed, tend to keep together, gaining strength and confidence from each other. How's the baby this morning? Oh, They're fine. overwhelmed, frightened perhaps, as they settle into jobs and homes. To a great degree, they're on their own and must find a new security to replace that which they've left behind. This new world will be theirs now. To some, it will give new opportunity and a wide horizon. Others, though, may still hear far and far away, the thundering Pacific surf, and see in mind's eye the reef-fringed isles of their people, the atoll people, and wonder.